Is there a man hiding in your attic? Don't be too sure if you think your attic is currently unoccupied. A man named Philip Peters thought that too, and it turns out he was dead wrong. This is the story of the Denver Spider-Man and the murder that perplexed Denver police for nearly a year. Philip Peters is a retiree. He lived in his home on West Moncrief Place for over three decades. He was married to Helen and their children were now adults. Not only was Peters a former railroad employee, husband and father, but he was also a musician and member of the Denver Guitar Club, where he and his wife sometimes gave guitar and mandolin lessons. In fact, it was through the Denver Guitar Club that Peters unknowingly first met the man who would become his eventual murderer. In the weeks leading up to his eventual murder, he had been staying in his house alone as his wife Helen was recovering at St. Anthony's Hospital after breaking her hip in a fall. He would spend his evenings over at his neighbour's house as they didn't want him being alone at home, which is ironic since he was never alone when at home. In the fall of 1941, Theodore Coney's snuck into the home of his one-time acquaintance, Philip Peters, to steal food and money. In the ceiling of a closet, Coney's found a small trap door that led to a narrow attic cubbyhole and decided to begin sleeping in a tiny attic, becoming the man in the attic, otherwise known as the Denver Spider-Man. For a while, the only times he ventured out were when his unwitting landlord was away but Coney soon grew bold and began to shadow Peters, following him from room to room. He claimed that it was a game he played and it was the first time that he ever felt in control. He managed to stay in the attic for around nine months. On the night of October 17th, 1941, Peters discovered a tall, lean, six foot man raiding his kitchen fridge. Rather than flee, a star of Coney's grabbed Peters' iron stove shaker and began beating the 71 year old man over the head with it. <coughs> After washing the utensil, he claimed that he ran back to his little room to hide. Peters' body was discovered an hour later by his worried neighbours and the Denver police were called. The police searched the house but couldn't find any evidence of the murderer. They found all of the home's doors and windows locked and there was no other sign of forced entry. They noted the trapdoor but believed a normal sized person could not fit through it. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. While detectives dug into Pierce's past, searching for enemies who hated him enough to want him dead. Mrs. Peters was eventually released from the hospital and returned home, a widow. She couldn't shake the feeling that someone else was there with her. Mrs. Peters brought in a housekeeper to help with the day-to-day -day chores, but the house never felt safe. They both heard noises in the walls. People claimed that they saw a ghost of Mr. Peters roaming the halls of the home, and a rumour quickly spread that the house was haunted. Mrs. Peters allegedly called the police so many times that they wrote her off as a cook and her housekeeper finally resigned after she realised that the spooky noises weren't going to stop. After this, Mrs. Peters abandoned the house and relocated to live with her son. So the house stood vacant and the strange sounds and disgusting smells continued to be reported to the police. But when they investigated the house, they couldn't ever find anyone and nothing was ever out of place. He later told the police that while they searched for him, he would sit on the makeshift door of the hole. The case was long cold, but a couple of the original detectives on the case just couldn't get it out of their mind. So they would drive by the abandoned house every so often just to see if they could come up with some new ideas on solving the case. One night, on a random drive-by, they see a shadow of a man in the upstairs attic window and quickly bust in to see what was going on, but the house was empty, until they heard a lock click on the second floor. Running upstairs, the police caught the sight of Coney's legs as he was going through the trapdoor and pulled him down. 
The suspect was arrested and taken downtown, where he confessed to his crime and told his story. Theodore Kunis was born in Illinois in the 1880s, but came to Denver in the 1910s, where he remained. As a child, he had poor health and was told by doctors that he wouldn't even make it past the age of 18. Given this information by the doctor, Kunis decided not to finish school. However, despite the odds, Kunis did make it to adulthood, but he still suffered from his poor health. Because of his health, lack of qualifications, and perhaps also because of the Great Depression, Coney struggled to keep a job long term, and frequently found himself without a place to live except for doorways and alleys around Denver. At some point, Peters and Coney's had become acquainted at the Denver Guitar Club and may have even shared a meal together. So one evening, Coney's went to the Peters house, hoping to be able to ask them for some money and maybe something to eat. Unfortunately, this was when Helen was at the hospital and Peters was keeping her company, so no one was home. Conies took his opportunity and decided to break into the house to steal food and money. However, he discovered a small opening in a closet that led to the tiny attic. He decided that he could make it his own. Conies insisted to the police that beating Peters had been a split second decision. After he had killed Peters, Kony sought refuge up in the attic, where he stayed until July. Denver police sent their smallest officer up into the cramped attic where Kony's had made himself a nest of sorts. He had collected his waste and he had not bathed during his attic residency, and his stench ended up making the officer vomit. After recovering from losing his lunch, Officer Fred Zarno said of the attic, A man would have to be a spider to stand it long up there. The newspapers heard this and ran with it. Theodore Cooney was dubbed the Denver Spider-Man. Conis was charged and convicted of murder by a jury and sentenced to life in prison in October of 1942. He was sent to the state penitentiary in Cannon City and remained there until his death on May 16, 1967 at the age of 84. He was buried in a nearby cemetery. And that's the story of Theodore Conis, a ruthless murderer who brutally killed a 73 year old man or a person struggling in life and making do with what little he had.